Good morning, everyone. There we go, I like that spirit. Welcome to the Ronald Reagan Presidential Library. My name is Tony Penny, and I'm the director of the Walter and Lenore Annenberg Presidential Learning Center here at the library. In honor of our men and women in uniform, past and present, who have fought so bravely in the name of freedom, I ask that you rise and join the students of Del Sur School, who will be leading us in the Pledge of Allegiance today. So please come up on stage. Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, liberty and justice for all. Excellent. Thank you very much. Thank you. So we are honored today to have some very special guests. Our education mission here at the Reagan Foundation is to help support the next generation of thoughtful and engaged citizens and leaders. President Reagan often said that freedom is never more than one generation away from extinction. Our speakers today include two survivors who know all too well just how frighteningly true this is. And an internationally acclaimed filmmaker who has done remarkable work to preserve their stories and others for all time. I am sure if he were with us today, President Reagan would be proud to know that his library is serving as a venue for all three of our guests to share their stories. In a 1983 speech, President Reagan said, our whole way of life is based on a compact between good and decent people, a voluntary agreement to live here together in freedom, respecting the rights of others and expecting that our rights in return will be respected. But the freedom we enjoy carries with it a tremendous responsibility. He continued, you, the survivors of the Holocaust, remind us of that. Good and decent people must not close their eyes to evil, must not ignore the suffering of the innocent, and must never remain silent and inactive in times of moral crisis. Tonight, let us pledge that we will never shut our eyes, never refuse to acknowledge the truth, no matter how unpleasant. If nothing else, the painful memory we share should strengthen our resolve to do this. Our founding fathers believed in certain self-evident truths, but for truth to prevail, we must have the courage to proclaim it. He finished, our most sacred task now is ensuring that the memory of this greatest of human tragedies, the Holocaust, never fades, that its lessons are not forgotten. Our speakers here today are here to ensure that these indeed are not lessons that are forgotten. Today we are honored to have Bernard Rammerstorfer, Hermine Liska, and Rene Firestone. I'll let Mr. Rammerstorfer, and I apologize, I'm probably butchering your last name, it's my American tongue, <laughs> uh, but I'll let you introduce and share their stories. But I wanted to say a few words about your work. For more than two decades, Mr. Rammerstorfer has dedicated himself to sharing the powerful stories of survivors of Nazi tyranny. He authored Unbroken Will, The Extraordinary Courage of an Ordinary Man, the story of Leopold Ingeleitner, who, when he passed in 2013, had survived a concentration camp and lived to the glorious age of 107 years old. He's also produced several documentaries, some of which we will see today, and toured Europe and the United States giving lectures and sharing his films. He's appeared at the US Holocaust Memorial Museum in Washington, DC, the Simon Wiesenthal Center in Los Angeles, Stanford University, Georgetown, the Library of Congress, Harvard, and we are proud to note a previous visit back in 2009 to the Ronald Reagan Presidential Library. And his films have won awards at film festivals in Austria, Los Angeles, Italy, Puerto Rico, Croatia, and New York, just to name a few. It is essential that the work of Bernard and others like him, and that the dedication of the survivors who join us today to share their stories ensures that we never forget the importance of freedom. It's essential that these stories instill within us the courage to make certain that it is not our generation, and certainly that it's not your generation, that is the one who watches the light of freedom be extinguished. So please join me in welcoming to the stage Mr. Bernard Rammerstorfer.
Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, dear students, dear teachers. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank uh, Mrs. Joanne Drake, the Chief Administra uh, Administrative of Officer of the Ronald Reagan Library for inviting us to, the, uh, to this library and to giving us the chance to present the life stories of Mrs. Liska and Mrs. Firestone and also my latest Holocaust project. And I also want to especially thank uh, Anthony Penny for all the hard work he did uh, in preparing this event and uh, he, he made it possible that we are here today. I also want to thank uh, Patty and Mike Garcia, they are our hosts here in Los Angeles. Uh, we are very thankful that we can stay with them and they are fulfilling us every wish. And I'm also very happy that many of our supporters and friends over the last uh, 10 years uh, are here with us today. Uh, without them, it would have not been possible to make uh, all the last lecture tours I did with Leopold Engleitner. And also we are having here uh, the English voices um, of the survivors in the documentary. So I'm, I'm very happy to have you all here. And last but not least, I want also to thank my family for their unwavering support over the last years. This is the fourth event during our U.S. lecture tour, Taking the Stand. We started on the East Coast at the University of Connecticut, then we were at Boston College, Harvard University. On Tuesday, we had an event for 300 students at Stanford University, and now we are really happy to be here because it's an absolute high point of our tour here at the Ronald Reagan Library. We will continue on Sunday at the Los Angeles Museum of the Holocaust, and next Tuesday, the last event will take place at Pepperdine University. I'm very happy and honored that Mrs. Firestone and Hermine were willing to make the efforts to join me and to share their peaceful experiences with us. Renee's story will provide us with an insight into the unimaginable cruelty of the Holocaust within the Auschwitz extermination camp, which overran her and her family like a wave of death. She will provide for us an outstanding example of how to overcome such a traumatic past. Despite losing most of her family, she found joy in life and was able to live a successful life here in the United States as a famous fashion designer. She will also give us lessons in forgiveness. On the other hand, Mrs. Hermine Liska, uh, beginning as an eight-year-old Aryan child of Bible students, was forced to undergo Nazi propaganda and the Third Reich's indoctrination program with the intent of re-educating her to become a useful part of the German Volksgemeinschaft, also referred as People's Community, which meant following Hitler's ideology without question. Although taken away from her parents, from her parents for four years at this young age, she did not give in and faced this seemingly hopeless fight against the roaring lion Hitler. But in the end, she won and provided us an outstanding example of strong faith following her conscience and withstanding peer pressure. I'm also very happy to see so many attendees as it shows your appreciation for the survivors and also interest, your interest in those whose actions provided light in the midst of the dark chapter, chapter of history. It is, unfortunately, one of the last opportunities to listen to, to see, to ask questions of, and to meet a survivor or survivors of Nazi tyranny. Today, you will become witnesses of first-hand eyewitness, eyewitness of the Holocaust, and you will 
learn impressive lessons for your future life. That's why I encourage you, please open your mind, free your spirit, and let what follows go deep into your heart, as it will benefit you for your entire life. Before we see a film clip and continue with the survivors' interviews, I'd now like to tell you some information about the book and the DVD, Taking the Stand. At the beginning, I want to share some personal experiences that motivated me to undertake this worldwide unique Holocaust project. I'm from Austria, and my hometown is Linz, where I went to school and now work and carry out daily business. It's a scenic city on the famous uh, Danube River, of which many are familiar with owing to a famous waltz by Johann Strauss. Otherwise, like is normal as in other cities. But most of the notorious and high-ranking Nazi criminals went to school and grew up in this city. When I mention two names, you will be astonished. Adolf Hitler was one of them, and the other was the chief organizer behind the mass murder of Europe's Jews, Adolf Eichmann. As a young boy, Hitler went to school in Linz in a building uh, which stands only 900 feet away from my former work office. When I would walk to my office, I often imagined that I walked the same street, crossed the same bridge over the Danube that Adolf Hitler did almost a century ago. I also saw the grave of Adolf Hitler's parents who were buried in a small town near Linz. The gravestone was removed just a few years ago because neo-Nazis started to make the location a cult site. And the little house where Hitler lived as a boy is also still in the town. Inter interestingly, I recently found some very old personal records of Hitler in a local archive, like his certificate of baptism, an application to redo the examination in French, drawings, and sketches, and the family's book of household account, which shows that uh, even in 1908 he received pocket money. These all indicate that Hitler lived an ordinary life as a boy. As a boy. By the way, I was allowed to take these copies, uh, to take copies of these records with me, so that I can let you have a look at after the event during. The book signing, you, you can take a look at it. You can also see his last will, political legacy, and the marriage record. Everything was written on April the 29th, 1945, one day before his suicide in the Führerbunker in Berlin. I also have, have with me original German Nazi newspapers from World War II, from the time of World War II, as well as American war reports. I often asked myself, what happened in the lives of these two boys, Adolf Hitler and Adolf Eichmann, who seemed normal to everyone at that time to make them later so evil, the mass murderers of millions of Jews and other innocent peoples. The following experience uh, happened just a few months ago. I entered in an electrical shop in Linz to buy a cable uh, for an internet connection cable. The shop is called Eichmann. It was not the first time I bought something there and never wondered about the name. But this time, I thought more about the name of the shop. I thought Eichmann, but for sure it has nothing to do with that Eichmann. Then I asked the owner of the shop, that question, and he told me, your suspicion is correct. Until a few years ago, this shop belonged to the son of Adolf Eichmann. I know we cannot make children responsible for their parents' mistakes, but a very weird feeling overcame me. I thought, while the lives of millions of Jews were extinguished, children lost their parents, brothers, sisters, and grandparents, and were never 
able to live anything close to a normal life, Eichmann's son was able to run a successful business and had the normal life that his father had destroyed for so many millions of Jews. You can imagine how conflicted I felt. With these experiences in mind, I started asking myself, what responsibility do we, the grandchildren of the generation who accepted Hitler and went along with him, have for what happened during that terrible time? My discussions with several Holocaust survivors and the personal friendships I developed with them confirmed what I felt. We, the grandchildren and great-grandchildren, are not responsible for what happened in the past, but we are responsible for the future and must ensure that something like this will never happen again. That realization was one of the reasons why I undertook the project Taking the Stand, we have more to say. The voices of the survivors must never be silenced, even if they are longer among us. Through this book and DVD, I wanted to let the survivors' voices ring out. Now I want to tell you sh uh, shortly how I approach this project. Based on my experiences gained through more than 200 lectures at schools and universities in Europe, Russia, and the United States with the world, world's oldest concentration camp survivor, Leopold Engleitner, I wanted to know what do the world's youth want to know from the victims of Nazi tyranny? And what are the recommendations of the last living survivors of the Holocaust and the Nazi era for a peaceful coexistence of humankind? That's why I incorporated 61 schools and universities in 30 countries on six continents into this project. The whole list of schools is available in the book as well on, on our website, www.takingthestand.net. For a period of five years, I asked students all over the world to provide a catalog of questions. I collected over 1,400, from which I distilled 100 questions that formed the basis of my personal interviews with the nine survivors. These survivors are from five different countries, Austria, France, Germany, the Czech Republic, and the United States. They were persecuted for reasons of ethnicity, politics, ideology, or religion. All in all, they were interned in 54 camps or institutions. In total, they were imprisoned for over 44 years and all together can provide over 800 years of life experience. And over the course of those years, they have amassed an enormous wealth of experience. The variety of the survivors' experiences makes it possible to display not merely a small sliver of the Holocaust, but to bring the whole spectrum of the Holocaust into view. I personally learned a lot from my work with the survivors, and it was important to me to pass their message on to a younger generation. The result is a 367-page book that is available also as an e-book and a DVD with a total running time from uh, more than two hours and also containing material for schools which can be used uh, for educational projects available in English and in German. In the book, all 900 answers of the survivors are documented. The DVD contains a short film biography of each of the nine survivors, as well as a selection of their most interesting answers lasting 10 to 20 minutes each. I also checked the historical accuracy of the interviewee's statement and did extensive research in various archives. For example, uh, one uh, research uh, brought me even to the Russian uh, military archive in Moscow. 
Taking the stand was highly recommended for the use in school by the Austrian Ministry of Education, and the book has already been translated into Russian. What is truly innovative about this book is that all the survivors were asked the same questions. As a result, a point for a point comparison of their answers is possible. The victims spoke about their use, they described their private family background, they recounted their most frightening moments and revealed their survival strategies. They tell us their personal lessons and provide advice and a message for future generations. The nine survivors recommended to us that each one of us can contribute with his or her life to a peaceful future world. Before we get now to know one of these survivor stories in detail and listen to Mrs. Liska and Mrs. Firestone, we will watch a 20 minutes abridged version of the DVD Taking the Stand. And after the screening, I would like to ask Mrs. Monica Porkert to, uh, to translate and moderate the interview with Hermine Liska. May I ask to play the film, please? I remember we got to the railroad station and we were very surprised that we are not traveling in passenger trains. But people among themselves were trying to excuse the Germans and they were saying that Germany is in such trouble that they need all their trains to evacuate their own soldiers. And that's why we have to go on cattle cars. We didn't know where we're going until we got there. We thought we're going to Germany. Every time I went to bed, I thought to myself, you're a dead man on vacation. You'll never get out of here. You think all those people had to die. Now you have to die too. From now on, you are a grown up. You must stand alone and go forward. I was alone, like a solitary tree in the woods. But I had to go on with my life. You have to forget, but you cannot forgive. You must not hate the person. You must not plot revenge, because that harms you even more. If I start blaming God, then I'm gonna excuse men, and this was really done by men, by humanity. Being hung on a stake, the prisoner was manacled with a chain on his back and hung up. We hung on the stake for an hour. I feel victorious. I won. I did not give in. Hermine Liska, who lives in Styria, Austria, was taken away from her parents in February 1941 as a 10-year-old, and she was able to return home on May 8, 1945. She was sent to the Weyern Home for Juveniles in Carinthia and to the Adelgunden Institute in Munich to be re-educated. She also had to perform a year of community service at an inn and small farm in Carinthia. She refused to join the Hitler Youth and to use the Nazi greeting, Heil Hitler. After the war, she married Erich Liska, gave birth to three children, and became a housewife. 
Since 1999, she has visited schools all over Austria as a witness to history. And every year she tells as many as 13,000 students her story. Renee Firestone, who currently lives in Los Angeles, California, USA, was taken away as a 20-year-old from her home in Hungary on April 29, 1944, and was liberated on May 8, 1945. She was confined in the Ujurad ghetto, Auschwitz-Birkenau concentration camp, and Libau female forced labor camp. She was subjected to Dr. Joseph Mengele's dreaded selections on a daily basis and encountered him face-to-face -face on several occasions. Her mother was gassed. Her sister Clara was shot after having been the subject of medical experiments. And her father died shortly after he was liberated. Only her brother Frank survived. After the war, she married Bernard Firestone, a survivor of Mauthausen concentration camp, and they lived in Prague. In 1948, she immigrated to the US with her husband and her daughter Clara. There, Renee Firestone ran a successful fashion boutique. In 1998, she told her story in Steven Spielberg's Oscar-winning documentary, The Last Days. She regularly speaks about the Holocaust to young people in schools and museums. Leopold Engleitner is from Upper Austria. As a boy in Bad Ischl, he met Austrian Emperor Franz Joseph, who was a contemporary of Abraham Lincoln and Ulysses Grant. As a schoolboy, he lived through the terror of World War I. After becoming one of Jehovah's Witnesses, Engleitner was sentenced to several jail terms in the mid-1930s. Leopold was arrested on April 4, 1939 at the age of 33. He was released from the concentration camp on July 15, 1943, on the condition that he work in agriculture as a forced laborer for the rest of his life. He was held in the prisons of Bad Ischl, Linz, Wels, Salzburg, and Munich, and in the concentration camps Buchenwald, Niederhagen, and Ravensburg, and its subcamp Kamturai. On April 17, 1945, on receiving call-up papers for the German Wehrmacht, he fled into the mountains of the Salzkammergut region, hiding there until the war ended in early May 1945. Engleitner's experiences are recorded in his biography Unbroken Will and in the documentary of the same name. Both have been translated into several languages. Toward the end of the 1990s, Engleitner began speaking about his experiences at schools, universities, and memorial sites in Europe and throughout the U.S. Although a very old man, he has traveled over 95,000 miles, almost four times the Earth's circumference, to speak as an eyewitness who campaigns against forgetting the lessons of history. Adolf Berger, who lives in Prague, was arrested on August 11, 1942 and was liberated on May 6, 1945. He was interned in Bratislava prison, a transit camp in Jelina, and the concentration camps Auschwitz, Birkenau, Sachsenhausen, Mauthausen, Redelzipf, and Ebensee. As a trained printer, he was a member of Operation Bernhard, a special detail in Sachsenhausen concentration camp where he had to print millions of forged English pound notes in the so-called counterfeiters workshop. His wife, Gisela, was gassed in December 1942 in Birkenau concentration camp. His mother and stepfather were also killed in concentration camps. After the war, he compiled an archive of photos and documents from concentration camps and spoke about his experiences to over 100,000 students in schools in Germany, Austria, and the Czech Republic. Berger wrote several books about his experiences. His book, The Devil's Workshop, formed the basis of the movie The Counterfeiters, which was an Oscar winner in 2008.
Richard Rudolph, having lived through World War I as a child, developed a deep revulsion for war. He was arrested by the Nazis on July 2, 1936 at the age of 25 and was liberated in early May 1945. He was imprisoned in Hirschberg, Breslau and Alexanderplatz in Berlin and was held in the concentration camps Sachsenhausen, Neuengamme and Ravensbrück and in the subcamps of Neuengamme, Das Wieck, Das Singst and salzgitter wattenstedt leinde Then from 1950 to 1960, Rudolf was interned 10 more years for his faith in communist East German prisons. In total, he spent nearly 19 years in six concentration camps and subcamps and in nine prisons. In January 1961, he succeeded in escaping to West Berlin. What was the closest you came to death? When the prisoners sabotaged the munitions factory, I wanted to blow it up. The fuse had been laid and was already burning, so there would have been an explosion. A guard or civilian worker saw it in time and pulled it out or cut it off so that it stopped burning. Every single one of us who worked there could have died. It still sends shivers down my spine. Today. Did you think you would ever make it out alive? I never contemplated whether I would get out alive or not, because I knew I would never get out. Auschwitz was liberated, Birkenau was liberated. But we, the ones who printed the money, were never supposed to get out alive. The counterfeiting of English banknotes was one of Nazi Germany's biggest secrets. Every time I went to bed, I thought to myself, you're a dead man on vacation. You'll never get out of here. How were you liberated from the camp, or how did you manage to get out of it? I was called to the guard room where they explained that I could be released if I agreed to spend the rest of my life working in agriculture, and I was willing to do that. I was covered in lice and weighed only 62 pounds. I had to get dressed because they gave me my civilian clothes. Two SS men were there, and they were determined to chase me through the cordon of sentries so they could shoot me. They would have thrown my cap beyond the line and shot me as if I had been escaping. But the capo prevented it. He said, he was a hard-working prisoner. He always worked diligently. He's going home now. That's been decided. He's going home. So the two SS men were stopped from satisfying their thirst for blood. Did you lose your faith in God while you were in the camp? Never in God. Never in God because I always thought that if I, if I start blaming God, then I'm going to excuse men. And this was really done by men, by humanity. And I would never... Uh, blame God for something uh, that <clears throat> that he equipped us to deal with. God gave us a, a mind and a heart and, and free will 
and uh, he didn't say I'm gonna take each of you by the hand and and take you through life so it was only men that was responsible for the Holocaust and is responsible for all the genocides that are going on now. What were the first things that happened immediately following your arrival at the concentration camp? On arrival, we were lined up in families. Then the doctor came and tattooed us there on the arm. I was given the number 3359. The little children were tattooed on their backsides. Were there any entertaining or light-hearted incidents that enabled you to forget all the suffering for a moment? Can you describe them? No. People were always under tremendous strain out of fear. All was fear. The fear was so great. The most dangerous thing was the beatings. You didn't survive those. I was lucky that when I was beaten, Hauptmann and Weiss and Binder were there. They... It was terrible. Terrible. They saved me. Was there ever a possibility for you to be released from the home or reform school? Yes, for me personally there was. It was when I was brought before the judge for the second time, and he asked me the same question again, whether I wanted to say a Bible student and would refuse to say hi little or not. One reply would have meant freedom, the other a concentration camp. So of course I had the chance to sign. But I didn't do it. Have you forgiven your persecutors? Yes, and again my mother played a central role because she told me from the outset. Minale, if someone hurts you, you must not hate the person. You must not plot revenge, because that harms you even more. Vengeful thoughts are the worst you can have. They do you more harm. Then she said, you must just remember that these people have been blinded by these policies, this propaganda, this national socialism. People don't realize what it will lead to. What effect did the slogan, Work Liberates, have on you? Well, to be frank, that slogan was a mockery. No person was ever liberated by work. I don't know of a single instance in which someone was liberated by work. It was nothing but a mockery of people in general, as if all the people who were interned were lazy. In reality, most of them were taken away from their work by being locked up. And it was then that my sister started to cry and ask me to find out when are we going to be reunited with our parents. We didn't know where our parents were. So I, in my ignorance, walked over to one of the overseers, one of the couples, and asked her very politely, does she know when we're going to be reunited with our parents? Well, it was then that she pointed to one of the chimneys and she said, you don't see the chimney and the fire and the smoke? There goes your parents. And when you go through the chimneys, she said, you will be reunited. 
and I had no idea what she was talking about. So I kept asking the prisoners, why would I go through the chimneys? What does that mean? Well, we found out later. So now I want, we want to start firstly with the interview with Mrs. Liska and I would like to ask uh, Mrs. Porkert, uh, she and her husband and the whole family, they are really huge supporters over the last 10 years. I'm very happy that she agreed to do this interview. She is from Munich and now we would like to, to ask Hermine for her first comment. Hermine, please. I'm sorry, I speak not English. Hermine was supposed to travel to the United States with her husband in 1952. Her husband gave her 10 little folders to learn English with. The first lesson read as follows. What shall I buy? Five cigarettes or a cake of chocolate? Hermine thought, I don't smoke, and a chocolate cake only makes you fat. Therefore, she never learned English. <laughs> so today, I have the privilege of translating for Hermine. So let's ask our first question right away. Which problems were you faced with through National Socialism? Also, welche Probleme kamen auf dich zu, als der Nationalsozialismus in Österreich kam? Ich war acht Jahre alt, als Hitler am 12. März 1938 in Österreich einmarschierte. Und das war große Aufregung. Und am nächsten Schultag kam ich in die Schule. Große Aufregung, alle Schüler waren im Hof. Die Hakenkreuzfahne war schon gehisst. Dann hat sich der Herr Direktor vor die Fahne hingestellt und hat eine kurze Ansprache gehalten, in dem Sinn. Jetzt können wir diese schlimmen Zeiten der Arbeitslosigkeit vergessen. Jeder wird eine Arbeit bekommen, keiner wird mehr hungern müssen. Den Bauern wird es auch sehr gut gehen. Also kurz und gut, wir gehen jetzt goldenen Zeiten entgegen und das verdanken wir alles unseren Führer Adolf Hitler. Und zum Schluss hat er gesagt, wenn wir jetzt in die Schule kommen, sagen wir nicht mehr Guten Morgen oder Grüß Gott. Von nun an gilt nur mehr der deutsche Gruß, mit der rechten ausgestreckten Hand Heil Hitler zu grüßen. Als ich dann in die Schule kam, äh, hast, du den Gruß, hast du den Gruß geleistet? Den Gruß habe ich nicht geleistet. Und warum nicht? Weil äh, in der Bibel steht, dass nur durch Christus die Rettung kommt und durch keinen Menschen. Aber dieser Gruß Heil Hitler, der hat ja auch viel mehr bedeutet, als wenn jemand einen guten Morgen wünscht. Mit diesem Gruß Heil Hitler hat man sich praktisch dieser nationalsozialistischen Organisation angeschlossen. Es war das äußere Zeichen der Nationalsozialisten. I was eight years old when Hitler invaded Austria on March 12, 1938. My problem started the very next day at school. There was big excitement. All the pupils were in the yard. The flag with the swastika was already flying. The principal took up his position in front of the flag and held a speech to the effect that the dark days of unemployment were now over. Everyone will be given work 
No one will have to go hungry anymore. The farmers will truly flourish. In short, he said, a golden age is ahead of us, and we owe it all to the Führer, Adolf Hitler. He finished by stressing that now, when we arrive in school, we will no longer say good morning or good afternoon. From now on, the only proper greeting is Heil Hitler with the arm extended. But I refuse to say Heil Hitler. Why? Because our parents had taught us not to use this greeting. Because the Bible says that salvation, which is what Heil means in German, comes from Christ alone and not from any person. But this greeting Heil Hitler meant a great deal more than merely wishing someone a good morning. In practice, using this greeting meant that you had joined the body of the National Socialists. The greeting was the visible trademark. So, Hermine, then how did things continue at school and what were the consequences? Wie ist dann weitergegangen in der Schule und was waren die Konsequenzen? Ja, also ich wurde äh, verspottet von Mitschülern und äh, zuerst hat mich der Herr Direktor, habe ich die schlechteste Schulnote bekommen im Betragen, hat mich zurückversetzt in die erste Klasse und äh, beim, äh, bei Spielen wurde ich ausgeschlossen und äh, eben die Verspottung dann der Mitschüler. Eine Mitschülerin hat gesagt, du bist ja Bibelforscherin. Eine andere hat gesagt, du bist ja eine Jüdin. Und ein Bub hat gesagt, dein Bruder, der Hans, der gehört ja aufgehängt, weil er die Ausbildung zum Kriegsdienst verweigert hat. Jetzt muss ich sagen, diese Verspottung der Mitschüler, das war für mich viel, viel schlimmer als die Konfrontation mit dem Herrn Direktor. Auf das war ich nicht so vorbereitet, weil Vorher haben wir alles gemeinsam, gemeinsam gemacht und dann war das eben wirklich schlimm, diese Verspottung. Und wie war das mit dem Direktor? Müsst du reinkommen bist in die Schule? Vielleicht ganz kurz? Ja, also er ist vor der Tür gestanden zur Klasse hinein und ich habe gesagt, guten Morgen, Herr Direktor. Hat er gesagt, Hermine, geh noch einmal hinaus und komm herein und grüß dich, sich gehört mit dem deutschen Gruß. Also ich bin wohl hinausgegangen und wieder hinein und habe halt wieder Guten Morgen gesagt. So, when Hermine entered the school building, the principal was standing at the entrance and uh, Hermine said, Good morning, sir. He said, Hermine, go back out again and then come in and greet me properly with the Hitler salute. So I obediently went out, came back in and said good morning again. The consequences were that the teacher excluded me from class. I got the lowest grade in conduct and the principal demoted me to a lower class as punishment. I was also excluded from other school activities, uh, school activities and games. Following this, some of the pupils started to make fun of me. One girl said, oh, you're a Bible student, in a very disparaging tone. Another one said, you're a Jew. At that time, if someone said you're a Jew or a Jewess, that was meant to be an insult, which shows the utter disregard for Jews at that time. One boy said, your brother, Hansel, ought to be hanged because he refused to train for military service. That was very, very hurtful to me, more hurtful than the consequences from the teacher and the principal. So then, Hermine, which difficulties were you confronted with next? So, was waren dann die nächsten Schwierigkeiten mit der Hitlerjugend? Mit zehn Jahren mussten alle Kinder zur Hitlerjugend gehen. Und da bin ich auch nicht dazu gegangen. Die Mädchen haben mir vorgeschwärmt, ich soll doch mitgehen. Es ist lustig, sie machen Spiele. Und was die Hitlerjugend noch bekommen hat, das war eine sehr schöne Uniform. Und das war aber ganz was Besonderes. Und ähm, die Jungen? Also die Mädchen sollten bei diesen Zusammenkünften zu guten Hausfrauen und Müttern erzogen werden. Und wenn sie dann verheiratet sind, sollten sie möglichst viele Kinder bekommen. Die Buben haben Kriegsspiele gemacht. Also sie sind spielerisch auf den Krieg vorbereitet worden. At the age of 10, all children automatically had to join the Hitler Jugend or Hitler Youth. 
but I didn't do that either. All the girls that joined were trying to get me to come. They were raving how much fun it was, and they were playing fun games all the time. And they got a uniform, which was really special back then. At those meetings, the girls were taught how to be good homemakers and mothers, and were prepared to have as many children as possible once they were married. The boys played war games and were trained for war that way. For clarification, let me explain. The children of the Bible students rejected the Hitler salute and did not join these youth organizations. This naturally attracted attention and the Nazi state reacted immediately. In a letter dated June 21st, 1937, sent to all police stations in the German Reich by the secret police Gestapo, the following was written. In order to prevent the propagation of the teachings of the International Bible Students Association among the youth, it is necessary to remove the parental influence on the children of those Bible students who are already known publicly. Since they endanger the mental well-being of their children, they will be stripped of their legal custody according to paragraph 1666 of the Civil Code. So, Hermine, what consequences did this letter have for you? Also, welche Folgen hat das Schreiben gehabt für dich? Im Jänner 1941 ist mein Vater vor das Jugendgericht geholt worden. Da wurde in einem Schriftstück vorgelegt, das ausgesagt hat, dass er seinen Glauben aufgibt, dass er bereit ist, für das deutsche Vaterland zu kämpfen und für meinen Vater der Zusatz, dass er seine Kinder nach den nationalsozialistischen Ideen erziehen wird. Und das hat mein Vater nicht unterschrieben. Dann wurde ihm gesagt, dass meinen Eltern von nun an die Erziehungsberechtigung entzogen ist und ich abgeholt werde und in ein nationalsozialistisches Erziehungsheim komme zur Umerziehung. In January 1941, my father had to appear before the juvenile court. He was presented with a document prepared by the Nazis for Bible students. It was intended to make them renounce their faith and to fight for the fatherland. And my father was supposed to sign it. But the document prepared for him included a writer stipulating that he had to raise his children according to Nazi ideas. He did not sign it. As a result, he was told that he and my mother had forfeited the right to raise children, and I would be taken away and put in a Nazi reform school for re-education. Let me add something. The National Socialist regime not only set up a brutal dictatorship in Germany which controlled all areas of life. In addition to the systematic murder of the Jewish population of Europe which ended in the Holocaust, the Nazis wanted to create a new type of human being who was to submissively serve the system. On December 1st, 1936, the act regarding the Hitler Jugend or Hitler Youth was issued. Paragraph 2 stated, outside the home and school, the entire German youth in the Hitler Youth is to be educated physically, spiritually, and ethically for service to the people and the nation as a whole. Adolf Hitler formulated his goals of national socialist education, or better said, manipulation of people, with the following words. My education is hard. What is weak must be hammered away. In my fortress of the Teutonic Order, a young generation will grow up before which the world will tremble. I want the young to be violent, domineering, undismayed, cruel. The young must be all these things. They must be able to bear pain. There must be nothing weak or gentle about them. The free, splendid beast of prey must once again flash from their eyes. So now we would like to ask Hermine how it went on. The worst day in your life then followed, didn't it? Wie ist dann weitergegangen? Das ist ja der schlimmste Tag dann gefolgt für dich. Anfang Februar 
kam eine Frau, um mich abzuholen. Sorry. Alle haben geweint. Und die Frau nahm mir einen Koffer. Und wir gingen zum Zug. Und es war ungefähr 45 Minuten. Und ich habe neben ihr geweint. Dann hat sie sich so hergebrückt zu mir und hat gesagt, hör doch auf zu weinen. Hättest halt Herr Lichtler gegrüßt und hättest können daheim bleiben. Und wir sind dann ungefähr 50 Kilometer weit weg, war diese Erziehungsanstalt. Weihern hat es geheißen. You can see how emotional that still is for Hermine. Um, at the beginning of February 1941, a woman came very early in the morning to pick me up. The whole family was standing in the courtyard crying even though they had prepared for that day. The woman took my suitcase and grabbed my hand. We had to go to the train station for about 45 minutes. I was crying the whole time, and then the woman shouted at me, quit crying. If you had greeted with Heil Hitler, you could have stayed home. I was then brought to a reform school about 35 miles away from my parents' house. So then, in this reform school, how did they want to re-educate you there? Also, wie wollte man nicht denn dort dann umerziehen? Was war da mit dem Fahnengruß? Der Fahnengruß spielte eine große Rolle damals. Jeden Sonntag mussten die Mädchen, also die Kinder, am, vor dem Frühstück antreten. Vor dem Haus war der Bellplatz und äh, äh, und ich, habe mich, ich wollte ja nicht auffallen, dass ich da nirgends mitmache, ich habe mich in der Toilette versteckt. Das ist mir aber nur einmal gelungen. Am nächsten Sonntag sind zwei Mädchen gekommen und haben mich gesucht und gefunden und haben gesagt, Hermine, du musst sofort hinaus und antreten. Jetzt bin ich hinaus, habe mich in die, also da waren so drei, vier Reihen Mädchen, vis à vis waren die Buben, Links oben ist die Heimleiterin gestanden in der Mitte und rechts unten der Fahnenmast. Dann hat jemand Achtung, also die Mädchen haben mich in die erste Reihe geschubst und dann hat jemand Achtung gerufen, alles war mucksmäßig still, alle haben die rechte Hand ausgestreckt, nur ich nicht. Dann hat die Heimleiterin geschrien, Hermine, heb die Hand. Und weil ich es nicht gemacht habe, hat das Mädchen rechts von mir und die hinter mir die haben mir probiert, die Hand hochzuhalten. Es ist ihnen auch nicht so recht gelungen. Was habe ich für eine Strafe bekommen an diesem Tag, weil ich die Fahne nicht gegrüßt habe? Ich habe eine Strafarbeit schreiben müssen und Hausarrest bekommen. Saluting the flag had a very high importance. Every Sunday we had to line up and salute the flag. In the beginning, I hid in the bathroom because I didn't want to be noticed and didn't want to line up. I wanted to make sure they didn't see me not saluting the flag. But it only worked once. The next Sunday, two girls came looking for me. They found me and said, Hermine, you have to come out and line up. So I had no choice but to go out and I lined up with the girls in the back row. There were three or four rows of girls, and facing us were the boys. The woman in charge of the home was standing to the left between these two groups, and on the right was the flagpole. The girls pushed me forward into the front row. Someone called, Achtung! There was dead silence. Everyone raised their right hands, except me. Then the woman in charge of the home yelled, Hermine, raise your hand! And because I didn't do it, the girl on my right and the one behind me tried to push my hand up, which didn't really work. I was punished for that. I received house arrest and had to write a long essay. And Hermine, please tell us, what actually was the worst thing about the daily routine? Was war denn das Schlimmste da in Bayern mit dem Bett gehen und für dich? Das Schlimmste in Bayern war das für mich das zu Bett gehen. Ich bin Anfang Februar 1941 nach Bayern gekommen und das war ganz ein schlimmer Winter, also minus 30 Grad. Und das Bett war so hart und kalt und da habe ich fürchterliches Heimweg gehabt, 
weil daheim war alles ganz anders. Mein Bett war in dem Zimmer von meinen Eltern und ich bin immer wieder aus meinem Bett zu der Mama ins Bett gekrochen, weil sie war so schön weich und warm, sie war etwas mollig und ich habe nicht einmal einen Polster gebraucht. Ihre rechte Hand war mein Polster, also praktisch habe ich in ihren Armen geschlafen und deswegen war das dann bei mir dort so schlimm in Bayern zum zu Bett gehen. In the first re-education home in Bayern, bedtime was the worst thing. I was sent there in February 1941, and it was the coldest winter in many years, and my bed was really hard and cold. At home, it was completely different. I did have my own bed, but I always crawled into my mom's bed and actually slept next to mom until I was taken away from my parents. My mom was a little plump, and it was just so warm and cozy in bed with her. I never even needed a pillow. Her right hand was my pillow. In fact, I really slept in her arms, but she never made me get out. So after more than seven months in that re-education re home, the Nazis couldn't observe any improvement in her behavior because she still didn't greet with Heil Hitler. That's why Hermine was taken 250 miles further away to Germany to the Adelgunden Institute in Munich in September 1941. Towards the end of the war, Germany was bombarded more and more intensively. Hermine, you did not receive any more letters from your mother then. How had your mother prepared you for the event that contact would break off? Wie hat dich denn deine Mutter vorbereitet, wenn dann der Kontakt einmal abbrechen würde? Was hat sie da zu Hause gemacht? Meine Mutter hat mir von klein auf die Schöpfung er erklärt. Ich habe immer wieder darauf hingewiesen, wie schön Jehova Gott alles gemacht hat, die Blumen und was es Gute zu essen gibt. Und sie hat so gern die Sterne gehabt. Wenn im Sommer eine mondlose Nacht war, dann sind wir vor dem Haus auf der Bank gesessen und dann hat sie mir die Sterne erklärt, den großen Wagen und den kleinen Wagen und das Siebengestirn. Also besonders hat sie das Siebengestirn geliebt. Und dann hat sie gesagt, wenn wir einmal getrennt sein sollten und wir keinen Brief mehr voneinander kriegen, es könnte sein, dass sie keinen von mir kriegt und ich keinen von ihr, dann soll ich zum Siebengestirn schauen. Und dann wird sie auch hinschauen und dann sind wir geistig wieder von, verbunden. Minerle hat sie gesagt, du brauchst dich nie verlassen zu fühlen. Jehova, Gott und Christus werden immer mit dir sein. Ich soll es nicht vergessen zu beten. Und was war dann, als du 1943 dann, auf den Bauernhof gekommen bist? 1943 sind wir dann von München aufs Land hinausgekommen und da habe ich wirklich keinen Brief mehr bekommen und dann konnte ich wirklich in der Nacht die Sterne sehen und es war ein Gefunkel früher, also das Himmel war übersät mit Sternen und, und es, das hat mich halt sehr gestärkt, und da draußen zwischen Haus und Stall zu stehen und, und die Sterne zu sehen. My mom had prepared me very well for that time. She had started explaining creation to me, the flowers and the stars, and how beautiful God had made everything when I was still very little. She loved the stars. On clear summer nights, we would sit on the bench in front of the house, and she would explain the constellations to me, the Big Dipper, the Small Dipper, and the Pleiades, which was her favorite. Then she said, if ever I were to be taken away from home, it might happen that I would not receive any letters anymore from her. Then I should look up at the Pleiades, and she would do the same. Then she added, Minele, which is her nickname, you don't ever have to feel abandoned because Jehovah God and Christ will always be with you. When I was sent to a farmhouse to work in 1943, I did not receive any more letters. So I went out in the evening and looked up to the stars and thought about my mom, how she's sitting on the bench at home and looking up into the stars right now. It might touch you to learn that several weeks later, this reformatory was completely bombed. The air raid shelter was also partially destroyed. 
Three adults and nine girls lost their lives in this attack. If Hermine had still been there, she would have likewise been killed because she always sat next to a girl who died that day. But through her faithful behavior throughout the war, Hermine had gained the respect of the reformatory director. He made sure that she was released and allowed to return home and thus escaped with her life. Please also be aware of the fact that what Hermine experienced is by no means a single case. Numerous children of Bible students were exposed to such traumatic events. The story you heard today, Hermine has already told 150,000 students in Europe during the last 16 years. Thank you very much. Now, mm. Thank you very much. Thank you so very much for your interesting uh, in my life uh, story. History. Story. <laughs> she prepared some Thank words you. in English. <laughs> mm, now I would like to ask Mrs. Rennie Firestone to tell us her story, and please. Thank you. First of all, thank you for coming and listening to us. I think this is a very important lesson for some of the young people especially. My name is Renee. Uh, my story starts in 1944, when two days after my 20th birthday, my family, my mother, my father, my little sister, whose name was Clara, and I were chased out of our beautiful home, each of us carrying a very small suitcase, leaving my parents' life's work behind. And three days later, we left our suitcases on the railroad tracks of the largest Nazi extermination camp in Poland called Auschwitz-Birkenau. As I was, uh, when, we, when the train stopped and someone yelled in German, heraus, out, Clara and I jumped off the train looking for our parents. We saw thousands and thousands of people pouring out of the carol cars. On the loudspeakers, they instructed us to leave our suitcases at the railroad tracks they would be delivered to us. Uh, all I could see is Nazi soldiers marching up and down the railroad tracks, holding on to vicious dogs, teasing the dogs at the people pouring out of the cattle cars. The dogs were biting, growling, barking, and of course the people were screaming, crying, terrified. And then they told us that now we're gonna go to a bathhouse to take a shower to refresh ourselves after this horrible journey. And then we are immediately going to be assigned to our work. While I was watching and trying to figure out where I am, something in my head kept repeating itself. Uh, when I was packing my small suitcase we were allowed to take with us, I came across a bathing suit that my father brought me from one of his business trips uh, years ago. It was the most beautiful garment I have ever saw. It was made of a shiny new material which we all know now. It was a stretchy fabric and um, it had a beautiful, shiny print of, of multicolored flowers. I remembered uh, wearing it, parading around our beautiful 
a public swimming pool like a peacock. The boys were whistling at me, and my girls were so jealous. And while I was holding this garment in my hands, I knew I have to take this garment with me. When I will be depressed or, or some, something will be hurting me, all I will have to do is look at this bathing suit and I will remember all the wonderful times and of course the love of my father. But my suitcase was full. I, I just could not find space for this. So when I heard the boots of the Nazis coming up to take us, I ran back and I put the bathing suit under my dress, I put it on. When we arrived to Auschwitz, they took us into a bathhouse to take this shower. Uh, while I was getting undressed, uh, under the watchful eyes of the Nazi soldiers, by the way, uh, I was standing there in this bathing suit. And I just couldn't take it off. And uh, then I all, all of a sudden felt some burning sensation on, on my face, and I realized the Nazi soldier uh, slapped me and yelled, take it off. I started to cry, and slowly I folded, I slowly I took my bathing suit off, folded it, I left it on top of the clothing. With that bathing suit, now I remember I left all those wonderful memories and my father's love. And also I left there six million Jews and five million non-Jews, amongst which 12,000, 12, uh, I'm sorry, 12 million children about your age who also never made it back home. Well, then they shaved our heads, stripped us of our clothing, and replaced them with a recycled rag. No socks, no stockings, no underwear. In the beginning, we thought that we are taking a shower because they are concerned about us, about this terrible journey. Later we found out that this was the only peaceful way they could take away our clothes and our shoes. So they told us we're taking a shower, which lasted all about a minute. Now orphaned and homeless, I roamed around, I'm sorry, Orphaned and homeless, I roam around Eastern Europe begging for food, sleeping in doorways and parks, and then a miracle happened. This was a few days after we were liberated from the camp. I ran into my brother. When the family had been deported, my brother was already in a Hungarian forced labor camp. He then escaped to Slovakia when he found out that the family was taken away and joined a small group of partisans, freedom fighters. He was lucky to have also survived. The Czech government after the war treated him as a war hero and he was rewarded with a confiscated apartment of a Nazi banker. We moved in, and both of us enrolled into uh, an art school. But we were penniless. Frank had an idea. He met a man who just returned also from the war from London. Uh, he was in the British Czech Brigade and brought home with him some uh, pure silk parachutes. And he gave us a few. So we decided, because after the war, merchandise in the stores was very scarce, as you can imagine, 
So Frank and I made hand-painted skirts from the silk. And we sold them immediately, of course. With the money, we bought the rest of the parachutes. And this man introduced us to other soldiers who also had some. So we bought all of them. And we started a little industry in the city of Prague where we settled down. A year later, Frank married his girlfriend, Hedda, who survived in hiding under German, pa under Gentile papers in Budapest, Hungary. No longer after, Frank ran into a young man on the streets of Prague who had been with him in forced labor camp. He brought him home and of course he stayed with us and a few months later he would become my husband. In 1948, the communists took control of Czechoslovakia and all of us decided to leave Europe. Frank wound up in the Haganah, which uh, I don't know if you know, the Haganah was recruiting for soldiers to fight for the state of Israel. So he again was fighting for the new state of Israel and his wife and two years old son John joined him later uh, where they remained. My husband Bernard had a half-sister in the United States, so we chose to come here. And my little daughter Clara, who was named after my uh, uh, sister, was 11 months old at the time. For some reason, Bernard's visa was uh, delayed. Uh, we don't know why. And so, considering the political climate in, in Czechoslovakia, Bernard insisted that Clara and I leave as soon as possible. Again, with one suitcase, a baby in my arm, and $10 in my pocket, which was all the Czech government allowed us to take out of the country, I arrived to America, the land of opportunity. At the airport, they made me pay something called the head tax. I was left with $4 beginning my life in the United States. Again, I have lost everything. I was in a strange country, barely speaking the language, and without my husband. My sister-in-law, who took us in her home in Allentown, Pennsylvania, was very, very kind to us. She owned a children's clothing store where she worked all day. I stayed at home with my baby and my sister-in-law's two children getting very depressed, wondering when would Bernard be able to join us? And what will we do when he gets here without any money. I found out that there was a large menswear factory in town. So Fanny, my sister-in-law, agreed to watch Clara after I came home, after she came home from work. And I got myself a night job in the factory. The foreman who hired me was an elderly man from Italy with a very strong Italian accent, so I didn't feel too bad about my very limited English. Uh, he was very kind to me. He gave me a lot of overtime, which I didn't know then, paid time and a half. By the time Bernard arrived, I had a nice little bank account. My father had a sister in Los Angeles, I found her and she insisted we come to California. Uh, in April 1949, we arrived to Los Angeles and of course immediately we fell in love uh, with California. And now our new life really began. I quickly became a successful fashion designer and a few years later we opened our own company. Bernard ran the business and I was the creative partner. But all the past experiences still haunted me. They haunt me still today. 
Since then, I have lost Bernard, who was the love of my life. I'm very proud of my successes and many awards I have collected in this country. I'm very grateful to America. That is the reason why I decided to devote what is left of my life, I'm now 91 years old, to informing humanity of the dangers that hatred and violence brings. In the past 38 years, I lecture about the Holocaust and other genocides, hoping that humanity will come to its senses and will stop killing each other. I last year visited Rwanda, where I interviewed some genocide survivors. And I cannot understand why this is still going on. Especially when I teach children, I want them to learn to respect one another, to get to know each other, stop bullying, and help, help each other. Now I, keep, I still keep asking myself, is being in America just a dream? Pictures keep flashing in my head of the past. In 1933, when a man named Adolf Hitler was elected chancellor of Germany, soon after the face of Europe began to change, Hitler's obsession was the Jews. And by 1935, the Nuremberg laws against the Jews were in place. By 1938, the borders of Europe were altered. Austria became part of Germany, and soon after Hitler wiped Czechoslovakia off the map. And in the beginning of 1939, Hungary, Hitler's closest ally, occupied our region. September 1st of that same year, Hitler invaded Poland and World War II was on its way. Our lives were changed, never to be same. Thank you very much. So our, our speakers today have very generously agreed to answer some questions. I would imagine that after hearing their stories, you might have a, a few questions for them. So I'm going to give you a chance, uh, our students in the audience, uh, if you have a question, please raise your hand. We have some staff members with microphones who are walking around, and we'll get to them. I also know that we have classrooms that are tuned in uh, from all over the place, some of which have been uh, watching this on a live stream. And so the first question I'm going to take is one that came in uh, via text, and then we'll go to a, a live question here. Uh, so the, one of the questions that came in um, was about sharing your story, which you both did so powerfully with us today. Um, when and why did you start sharing your story, and why is it important? You see, we, we see the emotional power that, that these stories have on you, even today, many, many years after uh, the events happened. Uh, what is it that compels you to continue telling these stories? Well, um, I came to the United States. Of course, I started a new life, so uh, I really wanted to forget the past. And uh, I became very successful very soon, so I really didn't think about the Holocaust. Then in 1977, uh, the Museum of Tolerance, the Simon Wiesenthal Center, came to Los Angeles. At that time, I was actually teaching a, a fashion class at UCLA. So they realized that I must be speaking English, and they called me. And uh, I must tell you that um, uh, Rabbi Cooper called me and asked me would I be willing to tell my story. And I said, story? I, I, I already forgot the story. I mean, I haven't been thinking about this story. And he said to me, well, Renee, uh, nothing has changed. 
and he reminded me that this, in, in Los Angeles, in one of the Jewish cemeteries, the neo-Nazis that, that day or that week, I don't remember now, were uh, desecrating the, the, uh, the cemetery. They were uh, marking the swastikas on the uh, stones and overthrowing the stones. And um, I still said, no, I, I don't think so. I'm not going to speak. But that night, I had a nightmare, the very, the only nightmare I had after the Holocaust. And the nightmare was that we were standing for roll call in Auschwitz. And the ground was red, and they told me it is soaked with blood. And the Nazis were yelling at us, uh, you know, uh, as they did in Auschwitz. And I woke up screaming. I woke up to my own voice screaming, they told us never again. They told us never again. And when I woke up and I realized what I'm saying and, and what this whole scene was, I called back the museum and I said, well, I don't know how much I remember, but I will try. And I have been, I closed my business a few months later and began to speak all over, actually, all over the world. Kamina, wann hast denn du begonnen, über die Zeit zu sprechen? Und wie war das? Ist dir das Anfang gleich gefallen? Es war, Zeugen Jehovas haben nie darüber gesprochen. Und 1980, ähm, ein Hermann Langbein, der war sieben Jahre in Auschwitz und der hat dann, ist schon in Schulen gegangen und hat den Schülern erzählt. Und 1980, und der hat den, die Politiker aufgefordert, dass eben ein Zeitzeugenprojekt ins Leben rufen sollen und die Zeitzeugen unterstützen sollen. Und das war 1980. Und da sind dann schon politisch Verfolgte gegangen in Schulen und 1995 äh, ist man dann an Historik an Zeugen Jehovas herangetreten, ihr müsst eure Geschichte auch aufarbeiten und erzählen und dann haben Zeugen Jehovas äh, ein Projekt gemacht in allen Landeshauptstädten und Bezirkshauptstädten ist eine nachgebaute KZ-Baracke aufgebaut worden 20 Schautafeln waren dort und Zeitzeugen und, und, du? und, und warum hast du dann zu sprechen und dann wurde ich eingeladen in eine, in eine Schule, wo die Lehrer ausgebildet wurden und meine Geschichte dann dort erzählt und die, die Frau Doktor, die die Lehrerin, die das gemacht hat, hat dann gesagt, Frau Liske, das stimmt alles, was Sie erzählen, und sie wird mich dem Ministerium empfehlen als Zeitzeugin. Ja? Aha. Let me translate, Monika. Okay, uh, Jehovah's Witnesses actually never talked about their story of persecution. In 1980, there was a man called Hermann Langbein. He went to school to schools and told his story already. Um, and he wanted to found a time witness project. Um, in 1990, um, historians asked Jehovah's Witnesses and a project was started where they told the story and rebuilt actual concentration camps, uh, the insides. Um, I personally was invited uh, to give a presentation at a school for teachers and the main teacher then recommended me as a time witness. Excellent, thank you. Uh, and now we're gonna go to uh, some student questions. And what I'll do so we can get as many student questions in as possible in the next couple of minutes is I'm gonna ask that each of our students uh, please introduce yourself, give us your name and where you're from, and if you could direct your question to one of our speakers and then we'll get the, uh, another speaker with the next question. Uh, so. Um, I'm Caitlin and I'm from Simi Valley. And uh, my question is for Hermina. Hermina, yes. Um, 
Oh my gosh. Um, well, how do you remember feeling um, when you, from living a normal childhood and then realizing that you were going to leave your parents and everything behind? Das war wirklich das Schlimmste. Ich muss noch erwähnen, wir sind vorher überhaupt nirgends hingekommen. Einen Urlaub hat es für den Eltern sowieso nicht gegeben. Und wir haben nie irgendwo anders geschlafen als daheim. Und so war eben das Wegbringen wirklich das Schlimmste dann. That was really the worst thing that was happen uh, that could happen. Um, we never went anywhere. There were no vacations. We always slept at home. The families were really, really close. So that was really terrible. Thank you. Do we have another question over here? Um, hi, my name is Sarah. Um, I'm from just like over there. I'm in, from Simi Valley too. Um, I wanted to know from Hermina, what was the hope that got you through all the hard times? Was hat dir die Kraft gegeben auch, ja? Die Kraft habe ich durch den Glauben bekommen. Und ich habe wirklich immer das Gefühl gehabt, dass mir Gott geholfen hat. Und ich habe wirklich eine sehr gute, für mich war Gott wirklich eine Realität, schon als Kind. Und ich habe mich halt total auf das, und so habe ich das eben geschafft. Und ich muss auch sagen, ich kann mich mit jenen, die im Konzentrationslager waren, überhaupt nicht vergleichen. Weil ich habe nie hungern müssen und ich bin nie geschlagen worden. Also es war zwar ganz einfach, Kartoffeln hat es immer gegeben und der Gemüse. Und ja, aber hungern haben wir nicht müssen. Und das war ja auch was Besonderes in dieser Zeit. The strength I got through my faith, I really felt that God helped me. Um, even as a little child, God was a reality to me, and that's what gave me the strength. And uh, I cannot compare myself with uh, concentration camp survivors, um, because I never had to suffer hunger. There was always some food, potatoes and vegetables, and I never got any beatings. Excellent. I think we have another question over on this side now. Hi, I'm Daniel Rolas, and I'm from Lancaster, and my question is directed to Ms. Firestone. What was your daily routine in the concentration camps compared to your daily routine in everyday life before the concentration camps? Oh, well, you, you can't even have any comparison. We, we were awakened at 4 o'clock in the morning by a whistle of the Nazi uh, commander, and we ran outside. This happened summer and winter, so you must understand. In Auschwitz, the temperature went up to 103 at summertime and went down to freezing uh, at, at winter time. We just had to run out, line up for roll call. The roll call lasted till about 12 o'clock. At, at that time, we were fed, which meant that we we were lined up in columns of five, and the first uh, prisoner in the column received a little bowl of liquid, which was called ersatz, uh, which resembled coffee or tea, but later we found out it was made of some grass. And uh, then we were dismissed, after we ate, this was the food, and we were dismissed. We couldn't go into the barrack. We were not allowed to go into the barrack. So we were sitting on the ground outside. And then at 3 o'clock in the afternoon, again, we had roll call, which lasted till about 9 o'clock in the evening. And then we were fed. 
the same liquid for the five of us in this one bowl, and a slice of bread. And after roll call, we immediately were put into our barracks, into our bunks, and next morning at four o'clock, again, we were up. And this was the whole 14 months that I was there every day. All right, we have, we have time for one final question from a student. Hi, I'm Vanessa from Oxnard, California, and I wanted to ask a question for Ms. Firestone. I wanted to know what was her hope, like how did she keep on going even though she had to leave her husband and her life that she had in her past? Well, most of us really didn't know what was going on there uh, because we were actually doped. The food, this liquid that we got had some bromide in it which made us calm so we don't rise up or we don't cause trouble, which we didn't know until we were liberated. And so there was no hope, we didn't think. Um, that was the reason why we were fed with the brome. So we shouldn't be thinking, because with a normal mind, nobody could have uh, uh, accept what was happening. Many people would have uh, committed suicide, which many of them even this way did. But uh, there was no hope or we didn't really believe that we will ever be free. There were selections going on. Every roll call there, a man by the name of Dr. Mengele, whom we called the angel of death, came around and with his finger pointing at people, he told them, arouse to come out and follow him. And they, they walked away every single day, never returning. So uh, while we were in Auschwitz, there was no hope. And we didn't think of liberation or freedom. Thank you. And I wanted to give each of our panelists one final chance. We have an audience full of students who have been an amazing audience today, who have listened and I think been very uh, impacted by the stories that you've shared with us. If you had one parting sentiment or one piece of advice that you'd like everyone in this room to think about as they leave here today, uh, what would that be? Well, first of all, I want to tell the young children that what I hear because I'm in the schools all the time. What I hear is going on in the schools is, is very disturbing. They bully each other. They don't trust each other. People bring guns into classes. Uh, I am I'm terrified of that future. I want the young children today to listen to the news and look at when they watch television, see what's going on in this world and try to do just the opposite. Just the opposite so we can save the world. You know, every time I look at a class, I think to myself, you know, uh, there was a man by the name of Adolf Hitler who single-handedly almost destroyed the whole world. So I'm looking at the kids and I figure, maybe amongst them there is one that will grow up and will save the world. And that's what I'm hoping for. Also in meiner Kindheit war der Gruppenzwang sehr, sehr stark. Alle haben das gemacht, was Hitler wollte, also sehr, 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 sehr viele Menschen und die wenige waren, dass das nicht gemacht haben. Und es gibt auch heute einen großen Gruppenzwang in der Schule. Ich habe immer ein Beispiel, wenn eine Gruppe bildet, sind vier oder fünf beisammen und dann will ein Sechster dazugehören, dann sagen die, ja, kannst schon dazugehören, aber du musst einmal 
etwas machen, du musst beweisen, dass du Mut hast und entweder rauchen oder trinken oder vielleicht sogar Drogen nehmen oder irgendetwas machen bei uns, ist sehr oft, dass sie irgendwo hinaufsteigen auf, auf einen Zug und dann kommen sie in den Strom, es hat schon viele Tote gegeben. Und jetzt ist, fordert es Mut zu sagen, nein, das mache ich nicht. Der dazu, wie das mache ich nicht. Und äh, äh, was ist dann? Wird er dann nicht aufgenommen? Er wird nicht aufgenommen, aber wer ist eigentlich der Stärkere? Die, die das machen oder der das verweigert? Der das verweigert, ist der Stärkere. Und auch äh, Toleranz. Bei uns gibt es ja so viele verschiedene Nationen und, und viele Menschen schimpfen und, und sind so dagegen. Und das ist eben sehr wichtig, auch Toleranz zu üben und Respekt voreinander zu haben. Das ist sehr wichtig und das möchte ich der Jugend, das gebe ich Ihnen immer mit, und auch nicht auf diese Propaganda zu hören, die es das wieder gibt, so wie damals beim Hitler, auf diese Menschen, die eben wieder Propaganda machen für sich. Und ähm, ja, und so wünsche ich euch wirklich alles Gute auf euren weiteren Schulweg. Und danke sehr für eure Aufmerksamkeit. childhood there was a lot of peer pressure uh, most of the people followed Hitler only some did not so today in school you face a lot of peer pressure sometimes there's a group of four or five kids and they say yeah you can join us but you have to prove that you're courageous so then they want you to prove it by smoking or taking drugs or um, doing crazy things um, It, and it takes real courage to say, no, I'm not going to do it. But then you're not included. So who's the stronger one? The one who refuses is the stronger one. I also want to encourage tolerance and respect. That is very important. And um, don't listen when you're confronted with any propaganda. And I wish you all the best. My final remark is based on the experiences I've made with uh, René and Hermine uh, and the other survivors who took part of this project. I think they have set examples to be followed. And for this reason, I would like to make the following recommendation to every young person here in the room. Try to spend as much time as you can with people of the older generation. Listen closely to what they have to say, learn from their experiences, and find true friends. And please join me for one final thank you for our panel today. We thank you so much for coming out today. We think we've learned so much from you. We appreciate it. So if I could ask everyone to remain in your places for just a moment, we're going to have our panelists, they're going to go up into the museum store where they will be signing copies of uh, the book uh, and the DVD. So we're going to ask them to um, leave first.